Uh, my presentation this morning is going to be on uh, a little different than what I've done before. This is more of a uh, policy type of presentation uh, entitled it Total Transformation, a Roadmap Toward Local Control of Education. Um, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can this morning. Uh, it's a little uh, heavier on text and uh, I apologize for, for that, but I'm going to move through it pretty quickly uh, in order to get across this idea of what I think we can do uh, in the state of Utah to help restore local control of education. So for my outline, I'm going to cover some foundational uh, statements to begin with and then detail the principles that I think come out of that, that foundation upon which we should build the ideas for a transformation. And then I'm going to talk about some reshaped roles of various uh, entities that are involved in this and then cover some specific things like standards and curriculum. So section one, foundation. So we're taught in this country that there are at, their ex at the extremes two, uh, of the two political parties, either socialism on the left and fascism on the right. And as many of you know, this is actually a, a poor model for how uh, the, the governmental structure or the economic system uh, operates. In reality, fascism, communism, and socialism are all parts of totalitarian style government. And so on the one end, you have uh, totalitarian control, and on the other, you have anarchy or no government. And somewhere in the middle, we have limited government, which is the American Republic system that we're all familiar with and happy with when it actually operates. <laughs> in that type of a system, we have capitalism and a free market exchange of ideas. Well, I think that the educational system is very similar to this. On the one side, we have the establishment that's existed for the past couple hundred years. You could kind of term them the socialists. And on the other end, you have the reformers. Uh, the people like the, uh, the Bill Gates of the world and UNESCO that are the fascists, the mega corporations that benefit from the education uh, system as they try to influence it and turn it for their purposes. Uh, and essentially, these are both parts of the same side of the education system. Compulsory government education being 100% government control and at the other end, no direction. Uh, but for us, our limited government, again, would be the, the parent and family-oriented uh, style of the education system where we have agency and free will, parental control, uh, we'll just call this the local control model. And uh, that's what essentially I'm going to be talking about today. And so I'm going to start off, I've got some quotes here, and I apologize again, some of these uh, statements need to be read to establish some foundation for what we're doing. This is a letter that Thomas Jefferson sent to Joseph Cable. He said, but if it is believed that these elementary schools will be better managed by the governor and council, the commissioners of the literary fund, or any other general authority of the government, than by the parents within each ward, it is a belief against all experience. No, my friend, the way to have good and safe government is not to trust it all to one, but to divide it among the many, distributing to everyone exactly the functions he is competent to. Let the national government be entrusted with the defense of the nation and its foreign and federal relations. The state governments with the civil rights, laws, police, and administration of what concerns the state generally. The counties with the local concerns of the counties, and each ward or neighborhood directs the interests within itself. It is by dividing and subdividing these republics from the great national one down through all its subordinations until it ends in the administration of every man's farm by himself, by placing under everyone what his own eye may superintend, that all will be done for the best. What has destroyed liberty and the rights of man in every government which has ever existed under the sun? The generalizing and concentrating all cares and powers into one body. James Madison in 1792, this was a House debate, uh, as Congress was debating how broad their powers were and how much latitude they might have under the general welfare clause of the Constitution, Madison, who was the father of the Constitution, tried to remind them how limited government works. 
He said, if Congress can employ money indefinitely to the general welfare and are the sole and supreme judges of the general welfare, they may take the care of religion into their own hands. They may appoint teachers in every state, county, and parish and pay them out of their public treasury. They may take into their own hands the education of children, establishing in like manner schools throughout the Union. I venture to declare it as my opinion that were the power of Congress to be established in the latitude contended for, it would subvert the very foundations and transmute the very nature of the limited government established by the people of America. Madison must be weeping in heaven right now. <laughs> what has our nation become? We no longer have limited government, which is essential to local control. And I believe it's time that we reestablish those principles. Uh, Wendy Hart is my school board member in Alpine School District. Uh, she's awesome, and you'll see from this statement. Uh, some time ago, I asked her a question about local control, and this was her reply. She said, my suggestion was always to bring everyone back to answering two questions. How does this strengthen the family and the parent-child relationship? And how does this help our kids know and prize the rights which God has given them so they cannot be enslaved and will be empowered to maintain their freedom? How would it be if every school board member based their decisions on those two questions? Under question one, we'd eliminate many of the math issues that plagued schools where parents couldn't help their children with their math homework. And on uh, question two, we would ensure our children had the right context in their education. Okay, uh, Senator Dayton talked about some Utah law. I'm gonna repeat some of that here. Uh, Utah state law recognizes that parental authority is supreme in the education of our children and the state's role is secondary and supportive. So we have here in, in uh, this Utah code section 62A under the rights of parents under both the United States Constitution and the Constitution of this state, a parent possesses a fundamental liberty interest in the care, custody, and management of the parent's children. A parent has the right, obligation, responsibility, and authority to raise, manage, train, educate, provide for, and reasonably discipline the parent's children. And the state's role is secondary and supportive to the primary role of a parent. State law also recognizes that parental involvement is the number one influence on the success of students. And numerous studies bear this out. If you do a Google search for uh, you know, top factors in a, uh, the success of a student, parental authority is number one. And state law recognizes this. It says, the legislature recognizes the importance of parental participation in the educational process in order for students to achieve and maintain high levels of performance. So. With those statements as our foundation, I'm gonna now outline the principles that I believe should govern anything that happens in our educational system and which will govern, as I mentioned, the transformation that I believe needs to take place. Now, I'll start off with a statement by Joseph Smith. He said, it mattereth not whether the principle is popular or unpopular. I will always maintain a true principle even if I stand alone in it. Sometimes we all feel like that and so, we have to identify what true principles are. And I believe that these are, are true principles that should govern what we do. On local control. Local control is at its heart self-government. We need to be self-governing individuals and we need to help our children to become that. The closer control is to individuals, the greater the ability to meet the needs of the people involved. Until such time as children become self-governing, parents are the God-given stewards over their development. Parents must retain the controlling influence on primary education issues. Thus, we must trust parents to do the right thing for their own children. It's hard to let go of power. Uh, Washington did it and became the most beloved president we've ever had in this country. He wasn't in it for money or power. He had the opportunity to become king and he declined that. And in fact, uh, when King George in England uh, had learned of Washington's death, he determined to put up a statue of Washington in Trafalgar Square in London. And he commissioned a statue. And the American ambassador in England went to King George and said, 
uh, Washington said that he never wanted to set foot on English soil. <laughs> and so the king, because of the great respect he had for Washington, ordered that three tons of Virginia soil be taken to England, <laughs> planted in Trafalgar Square, upon which Washington's statue rests today. That's the power of honor and humility. Okay, some core principles on parental involvement. Parental involvement is the number one factor in student success. State law recognizes that parents have a fundamental liberty interest in the education of their children. It is wrong for parents to abdicate responsibility to someone else to educate their children, thus greater parental involvement is a God-given obligation. Parents have primary responsibility over their children's education. As such, parents must have primary authority over the same. To have responsibility without authority is destructive to parental involvement. One more slide. Core principles on schools. The purpose and focus of a school should be to educate. Education must be to meet the needs of students based on parental input. Things that do not focus on this goal should be removed. Every school must be free to innovate for the benefit of their students. Where one school succeeds, other schools will follow. And where a parent disagrees with the approach a teacher or school takes, that parent must be free to take their child to another nearby school or place him or her with another teacher. So those are the principles. The next section, I'm going to talk about the core transformation that I think needs to happen in order to implement these principles and bring about local control that matches them. Why do we lack parental involvement in our school system? This cartoon is how many of us have felt attending board meetings. It's as if the school board puts on earmuffs to tune out anything you say because you're not their neighbor. Large entities don't uh, make themselves uh, available to people that come in from out of town to complain and gripe about what's happening. They aren't really accountable to you. So, parents attend school board meetings. I'm sure many of us here have attended these. The board serves the district instead of parents. Parents' concerns are ignored. Parents lose confidence in schools supporting them. Parents become apathetic and uninvolved. And parental involvement is reduced or ceases. I know I have personally experienced this and many of you. That's why we lack parental involvement. I'll just use this as an example, Alpine School District, where I live. It's the largest district in Utah, 72,000 students, 70 schools, seven school board members. Before redistricting in 2010, one board member, Paula Hill, had 23 schools under her jurisdiction. Now, as a board member who might have a job, that is an enormous responsibility that you cannot do. Average time commitment on the Alpine School District Board is 15 to 20 hours a week. There's no way a school, member can, school board member can address the needs of individuals. It's just too big. So a board member can't be responsive to parents' concerns. So how do we change? How do we create a more responsive system? In Utah, this is a chart of the last 60 years. Uh, from 1950 to 2010, you can see the population of Utah, as the blue line here, has grown, it's almost quadrupled. And during that time, we have moved all the way from 40 school districts to 41. Huge, huge <laughs> jump there. By contrast, using uh, an entity that everybody in this room is familiar with, the LDS Church, you can see that the LDS Church population during that period of time has gone up by a factor of almost 14, and they have had split after split after split in their uh, stakes, the, the larger unit of the church, such that we get this slide. The LDS population per stake in the last 60 years has actually declined while the number of stakes has gone up. What that's done is it's created 
a lot more leadership opportunities, it's given local control, and it's, it's allowed people to grow and develop their skills and talents and to be of use in that uh, particular institution. So, what if schools in Utah followed a similar approach and we tripled the district? These numbers are from a few years ago when I first did this uh, research. Under the, the current system back then, there were only 40 schools and there were 140 districts, sorry, and 116 high schools. So if you were to take uh, that model and say if every high school became a district, you would wind up, you know, tripling, almost tripling the number of high schools and the number of schools or students per district would be about 4,500, which is very close to the number of uh, LDS members in a stake, which is about 4,800. I think this is a, a better uh, model. To, to split these things up. So for example, an Alpine school district, right now eight high schools would mean there'd be seven uh, district board members becoming 56. And then what if you uh, replaced the school community councils and actually had elected local school boards at every school? You'd have 70 schools turning into 490 school board members instead of seven. Parental involvement would dramatically increase going from 7 to 490. Utah's education budget is 4.3 billion dollars. Cut across 41 school districts, that's 287 board members trying to oversee 4.3 billion dollars of spending. With the model that I'm proposing where every school has a school board, you'd have 1,044 schools with 7,300 board members. That's a 25 times increase in the number of parents involved looking at what's happening in our school system. Now, if five people knew a school board member, you multiply the five times 25 and you get 125 times increase in parental involvement. My school board member, Wendy Hart, hears from me occasionally, but she lives a few neighborhoods away from me. What if your local elementary school had seven board members. There's, you're almost guaranteed to have one or two board members in your neighborhood that you might go to church with, but you would at least be able to say, hey, I have an issue with something happening at the school, just even in passing them in your neighborhood. Parental involvement then takes on a much bigger picture when we consider doing something like this. So current district boards, people don't run for the board. It's a huge time commitment, 15 to 20 hours a week. You almost have to be retired to be on the school board. Otherwise, you are just consumed in all your free time. A single board member covers many schools. You can't review the things that are happening at all the schools. Public oversight is a joke, particularly financial approvals. And board members are actually instructed that their role is to protect the district rather than represent the taxpayers. So under this model, new local school boards would be perhaps two to three hours a week. You have a monthly board meeting. Board members would still have time to spend with their families. More children will see their parents and neighbors involved in schools and community. There's much greater oversight by taxpayers, and charter schools are already doing this successfully. So it's not that big a leap to say, hey, it's working here. Let's implement it over here. Remember the story about Jethro and Moses, okay? Jumping back to uh, the Old Testament. Every day, Moses would sit in the judgment seat and there'd be a line of people from all around the camp coming to him to deal with their problems. Well, Jethro took one look at this and he said, Moses, this is a problem. He said, you're wearing yourself out. Not only that, you're wearing the people out. How many of you have felt worn out going to a school board meeting, <laughs> okay? It wears you out because you are not listened to and it's a chore to go there. So he said to Moses, you do the hard stuff that nobody else can do, but delegate power and localize decision-making. He said, appoint captains of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000 and let them handle the smaller issues. How many people thought, oh, I've got to go across the camp to see Moses, and it was some big trek, and so they just didn't even do it. They, they just lived with whatever was bugging them. So this is the principle, to scatter the power 
and better prepare people to handle decision making and gain that leadership at the local level. So how about finances? This is a question that comes up, you know, well, how are you going to split the districts and you know, because everybody knows that when Canyons and Jordan split a few years ago, that completely destroyed the idea of splitting districts. So here's my proposal. Number one, 41 school districts become 41 tax zones. Boundaries are fixed and they will never change again. All tax collections in those zones are distributed pro rata to every school based on monthly enrollments. So what this means is we're not going to count students in October at a school and say here's your money for the rest of the school year regardless of if kids move into the school or move out of the school. We're going to say every month you'll tell us what your enrollment is and then you'll get the next monthly allotment of funds. So as that number might fluctuate during the school year, we're going to allow them to get more or less money so that we're educating uh, the children that are actually there. Every new high school would be a new district within a tax zone. And one high school in a tax zone might become the fiscal district who would be in charge of those funds. Or they might contract with an outside CPA firm to handle collection and disbursement of funds in a trust. Current district offices could be assigned to the fiscal district. Maybe it would be the high school closest to the uh, offices so that the high school's board would provide oversight in the district office but there'd be no more splitting districts the old way where there's this big argument of who has the tax base and who doesn't and how are we going to divide this fairly. You just freeze the district as it is and say, done. Everybody that's in this district, every new school that comes up, this district with its tax base will pay for it. The major key to this though is 100% local financial control because without financial control, there is no local control. If somebody else is making the decision for you about how to spend your money or spending the money and you never even see it, you don't really have local control. Decision makers have to have control over the financial decisions. So local schools get 100% of the cost to educate a child. All taxes collected are distributed directly to the local school to allocate with its elected board. So state income taxes collected, paid to the schools. Property taxes within the county, paid to the schools. Any other taxes might go to the fiscal district, paid to the schools. Then those schools have the ability with their board to determine how to uh, spend that money and let the people in that community watchdog the board. Uh, current state and district entities that provide services to a school will then provide a line item invoice to the school showing all the services they are providing and charging for. So the state office of education, the district office that's no longer an intermediary that takes something out of the education system now becomes a support for the local school and will invoice the school for the services they actually provide. And then it'll be up to that local school to make the determinations of what services they need and pay those entities, just like any company would do with its vendors. Local school boards then determine the expenditures for services, uh, SAGE assessments, raises, all the expenses that might go into a school. This is real empowerment. Uh, and so parental involvement becomes meaningful when you have full responsibility, authority, and financial control. More, more parents will want to be involved when they see they can have real responsibility, real authority, and real influence. And there are going to be major tertiary effects uh, to those who feel that their local school is truly theirs. And uh, they know their board members because they're in their neighborhood. Remember what Jefferson said, No, my friend, the way to have good and safe government is not to trust it all to one, but to divide it among the many distributing to everyone exactly the functions he is competent to. So this is Moses or Jethro's counsel to Moses. And so then the question becomes, well, what are the people competent to? <laughs> okay. Winston Churchill once remarked, if you want a good argument against democracy, spend five minutes with a voter. <laughs> We've all seen that, but 
the, the point here, it might take a, a little bit of time for parents to get accustomed to new authority, new responsibilities, but let them grow into it, you know, and, and become competent to the things that they can become competent in. So one of the concerns that I've heard, uh, actually from a state legislator, not Senator Dayton, uh, people are incompetent. Uh, they're sus we're susceptible to bad local decisions. Well, doesn't that already happen at the district and state level where they have concentrated power, we get a bad decision and it's pushed clear down to the bottom of the ladder. Course corrections are easier when neighbors have a board member close by that they can complain to. And the argument that people won't choose correctly has been going on since the beginning of time. So liberty is still the right choice. Uh, another concern, there's gonna be micromanagement of the board or of the school. Well, local boards are governing boards, not managing boards. So they're going to help set policy and procedure. They're not gonna be in the classroom saying, this is how you need to teach the kids. It's, it's, they need to function like a regular board. Another concern, financial controls will be poor. Well, the approximate cost to do an audit of a school might be about $10,000. I used to be an auditor. And so if you were to audit all 1,044 schools in Utah, you'd be lo looking at a little over $10 million a year. Now, I don't think every school needs an audit every year. They can have reduced uh, services to review uh, the financial transactions that have taken place. They could contract out with a CPA firm. There's all kinds of things that can be done there. But that $10 million is a nominal amount, especially when you start talking about something like one-to-one -one devices and the hundreds of millions of dollars that would go into that. And inner cities, uh, this is another concern that people have uh, brought up. There's a, a lack of, uh, potentially a lack of leadership for local boards in inner cities. And so I would say that individual schools that might lack parents who even want to be involved on a school board it can have assistance provided by the district office at the high school to help come in either in an advisory capacity to help train them or even to, to provide members for that board. Okay, so what are other states doing? Uh, Idaho has 151 school districts right now. Uh, Utah has 41 and we currently have 141 high schools. So just making high schools each a district would put us a little bit more in line with Idaho. Idaho's graduation rate, interestingly, exceeds Utah's by several percent. Now, I don't know that that's parental involvement, but there's definitely a lot more parental involvement when you have 151 school districts as opposed to 41. California has 1,050 school districts, which happens to be about the number of schools in Utah. So, again, uh, I think that as we look at this model of having real local control, uh, it's, it's not insurmountable to have a school board at every school. The bottom line is, the closer leaders are to you, the more influence you have over their decisions. Washington, D.C., centralizes power away from us so that we can't easily change things or communicate with influential people. That's why the Constitution was to be a limitation on powers that are centralized so that we, the people, would be closer uh, and able to retain the powers where we can influence them. So, elections. I think state school board members can still have four-year terms. District uh, school boards at the high school should also have a four-year term. Local school boards at a middle school, I think, can probably have a four-year term. They're going to pull from a broader area uh, where that middle school would cover several elementary schools, but at the elementary level, I think a two-year term is sufficient. That's what a, a school com uh, community council member might serve right now. And so what this does is it gives you an opportunity that as your children grow from young to old, you get involved at the local school and you get your feet wet in leadership and administration. You go from elementary to middle to high school and beyond serving on boards that you've been kind of taught to grow into and you can see uh, the, the growth there in leadership that can f be fostered in our communities. So now I wanna talk about reshaped roles. Based on the principles and this, this transformation, what does that actually mean for the people that this affects? Parents, number one, they're responsible for their children's education. 
they're going to have to play a bigger role when we move things right down to their level. They have total authority to direct their children's education, more customized schedules, be able to choose teachers, and so on. They cannot have their rights, responsibilities, or authority infringed. We need to be able to set that up and actually let it function that way. And they decide what constitutes educational progress for their children. Nobody else can say, we're going to have you, your child, do this, jump through this hoop, take this test, and we'll determine. It's you as the parent who says, that's where my child is progressing. Parents are the employers and stakeholders, and schools serve a secondary and supporting role to their needs. That's state law, but we don't actually implement that. Okay, what about teachers? Teachers will work with parents to support the educational goals of students. Now, a lot of teachers will say, well, I already do that. Well, that, that is the case for many teachers, but there, there needs to be a stronger connection. And when we remove district politics, because we've got a local board at an elementary school, and that teacher knows that her principal, which I'll get to in a minute, is, is hired by the board, and is not playing politics with people above him or her, then that teacher is going to be more amenable to being open about what's taking place in their classroom. Teachers should not be evaluated on standardized tests. And we need to remove as much red tape as possible and state mandates from teachers, particularly special education teachers. So the, the total focus should be on meeting the needs of students and not on other stakeholders. People tend to act like they're treated. I know many of you in this room, uh, how many of you know the, the movie Johnny Lingo? Right, a lot of you? Okay, for those on uh, video that might be watching this, Google Johnny Lingo and you'll be able to find this uh, short video. Um, in that video, you know the story, Johnny comes to the village and he wants to marry Mahana. And Mahana is the outcast and it's because of the way she's been treated all those years. And so Johnny, you know, pays the, uh, the dowry and makes her his wife. And, you know, sometime later, people remark how beautiful Mahana has become and, and the transformation that's come over her. And they didn't know that she was this beautiful individual, uh, but Johnny saw that. And we need to see that potential, that we need to see that, that beauty in our teachers as well and treat them like the professionals that they are, give them greater freedom within the context of true local control so that they can really focus on the needs of the students and not be accountable to other entities besides parents. No teacher should be fired for light reasons, but neither should they be immune from removal for reasons of complacency or incompetency. Students. Students must first and foremost be responsible for their own education. They need to be self-governing. To accomplish this, more attention should be given to their needs. Mentoring and independent study should be a key component of a student's education. They need the freedom to explore the things that they really have a talent for and are interested in. This may involve some difficult but valuable life lessons, but it should also involve significant freedom to study and learn things they're interested in independent of school. Without the freedom to learn the, about the things that you choose in public school, why would anyone think that students would choose to continue to learn throughout their lives? The joy of learning comes by choosing something of interest or in an area you have a talent for and then pursuing it. I know one public school teacher who recently told me this story. He'd assigned a class a project and one particular student who was sort of that student that never really participated said, I'm not gonna do it. And then a few days later, the student came to him and said, you know what, I'm gonna do it, but I wanna do it on something that I choose. And he said, fine, what do you wanna do it on? And he said, I wanna do it on the history of political cartooning. And he was like, wow, okay, well, go ahead and do that. And about a week later, this student's uh, mother called this teacher up and said, what have you done to my child? He is going to the library every night for hours and doing I don't know what. Well, 
the assignment was to do a presentation for about 10 minutes. And this particular uh, student came and did his presentation. It took an hour and a half. Now, if every student could only have that opportunity to find something that they were passionate about and dig into, I think we would see some great things happen with that type of freedom. School principals. Uh, the principal at a local school will now be hired by that local school board and functions as the CEO or director of that school. The local principal is fully accountable to the board for his job and not anyone at the district office. He or she hires and fires teachers and functions under the policies that are set by the board. Principals at high schools function as both the principal and superintendent of the district. We don't need a redundant kind of position. We're reducing the size and scope of what happens, and so the principal can function in that role. I also believe that principals should teach a class while they're the principal, so that they stay in touch with what's going on in the classrooms. The local school board, total engagement. No more school community councils. We don't need a, a council to get together and do, hey, we're gonna look at having a school improvement plan and allocate the land trust money and do these really simple things that are already outlined and oftentimes governed and directed by the, the current principal. So this is a full board. They hire the principal, they objectively protect teachers, they review the expenditures for the school and put them online. They set school policy and direction, including standards, curriculum, and testing policies. They meet at least monthly. And they be the people that teachers and parents can come to with issues to resolve for the school. And they appeal to the district board when they're unable to resolve something at their school. So the district board functions as the local board at the high school and they function as a parent board for issues that can't be handled within the, the high school boundaries by a local school. The state legislature. We need the state legislature to pass laws preventing schools and districts from engaging in any transactions with federal agencies. <laughs> One of the big problems here is when local schools do this and they reach out for federal money. Uh, they come with strings attached and requirements that oftentimes supersede local or state oversight. And so that the federal government creates a bridge over those barriers right into the school. Uh, they help ensure the state board sets only broad policies. And they need to retrieve the taxing authority for property taxes back from districts since legislatures can, legislators can see the bigger picture on taxation and districts are fragmenting under this plan. So let's just pull that back to the legislative uh, state level. The bottom line is the state must establish the ground rules, but parents elected to local boards have broad latitude in what they choose to do at that school. So the uh, reshaped role for the Federal Department of Education That covers that. <laughs> so now to uh, some specifics. Based on everything that's come up uh, to this point, we'll cover standards. Uh, number one, the limitation of state involvement in standards should be to set very uh, broad items. They should be de standards should be determined locally, but the state can set overall goals, not mandates. So for example, they might say a child should have multiplication, automaticity, or uh, mastery of math facts by third grade. Algebra one completion by eighth grade for typical students on a, on a regular trajectory. Uh, they might say US history in fifth, eighth, and 10th grade. Students, though, should be in skill groupings. Uh, and, and when they are, they don't really need standards because a child is, all standards really are, like for math, is a path. It's what is taught now, what comes next, what comes next, what comes next. And we should be letting children move through that path as fast as they want to and progressing at their own pace. 
Yeah, and, and at their own pace. So if I, I've, I've typically heard from teachers, there might be a range of five to seven years of skill level within a given classroom. And so when you have uh, students who are at the, the lower end or the upper end and you mix them together, what's gonna happen? Everybody's moving, moving at the pace of the lower end. We've gotta let those kids that are able to progress at, at the pace that they're comfortable with. And that includes not stressing out the lower end by saying, you have to progress a little faster because we don't wanna leave any child left behind. And so we're gonna force you to move ahead. So we need to provide real opportunities for accelerating in subjects. It wasn't many years ago that we um, didn't have standards in schools at all. And in fact, in the time of our founding fathers, uh, literacy rates in communities were measured anywhere from 70 to 100%. And at that time, they measured literacy, not by a test at the school, but by the ability of the population to read the newspapers of the day and engage in meaningful discussion, meaning they were reading the Federalist Papers. That's how they determined literacy rates in the latter part of the 1700s. <laughs> if we were to do that today, <laughs> I'm not sure we would break 10% literacy with, with the current population of our country. Curriculum. Uh, under this new plan, we've got 25 times more parents reviewing curriculum choices for their schools and having local control over their, those decisions. We can use real research-based pr uh, programs without having somebody above them say, here's what you're gonna do. Now I could talk at some length about certain programs that have been implemented in our schools that have no research to back them. Local schools can choose what to incorporate and focus on with the help of their local school board. Assessments. Uh, schools and districts should choose their own testing that they deem useful and appropriate for children. Uh, Non-educational services. The purpose of schools is to educate, right? So why mess with non-educational areas? I believe that we could privatize the busing, maintenance, and lunch functions, spin them off, allow the uh, current managers of those functions to become sort of the CEOs of the new businesses who will then contract with the schools, just separate that function. And so if you need a new bus route for your school, you just contact the CEO of the busing company and say, hey, we want to contract with you to add this bus stop. Fit, fit that into your schedule and tell us what that's going to cost. Let them figure out the specifics of how to do it. Now to implement this plan statewide all at once would be very challenging. So I would propose that a few new districts around the state get their feet wet the first year, figure out the challenges, and then roll it out to the rest of the state in the next year. Uh, it might be appropriate for current districts where there's only one or two high schools to become those pilot districts and make sure things are fully lined out for larger districts to split in subsequent years. So maybe five or more high schools and the schools that feed into them um, become the, the pilot test for this. We elect new boards next fall for those schools and 100% of school funds go to the school. So we don't siphon any of that off elsewhere. So wrapping this up, I wanna say a couple things about educational freedom. Uh, the first thing is how can we ever take half a million children in Utah and say, you all need the same skill set because you'll be competing for the same jobs. That doesn't work. That's insane. In one household that I'm very familiar with, I have five children who all have different interests, talents, goals, and developmental speeds. And when we lump children together based on a date of manufacturing, as Sir Ken Robinson calls it, <laughs> uh, we're using a factory assembly line model of education, which might be great for parts coming off a, a, a car factory plant, but it's not great for developing the unique variety of children that we have. Second, we need to end school to work notions. We need to give our children ideas of what's out there, but give them freedom over what direction to pursue. Uh, we treat STEM like it's the end all be all of education. Uh, but not every child wants a STEM career. But 
maybe with more local control, we'll find stronger curriculum and with increased parental involvement in elementary schools, the math programs will naturally lay a better foundation for interest and skill for these uh, children and they'll naturally want to pursue STEM careers as, as they naturally develop those uh, talents. Mentoring and freedom should start at an early age so students learn to pursue their own interests. This is all about being lifetime learners. If children can't pursue their interests, they won't love learning and become a lifetime learner. Local control helps ensure more parental involvement and greater freedom for children to pursue their dreams. This is just common sense. So, if we accept the principles of self-government that our framers intended for our country, and if we accept that control should be at the most local level possible, and if we accept that parental involvement is the best path to educational success for our children. And if we accept current Utah state law, then this plan seems the most logical framework to greater success for our children. Not just educationally, but for life preparation. I believe this is a mandate to legislators, educators, parents, and others to chart the future of education in our state and set our children on a course for greatness. Thank you.